the schoolmaster's letters. At sunset, the schoolmaster went up to his room to write a letter to her. He always wrote to her at the same time, when the red wave of the sunset, flaming over the sea, surged in at the little curtainless window and flowed over the pages he wrote on. The light was rose-red and imperial and spiritual, like his love for her, and seemed almost to dye the words of the letters in its own splendid hues, the letters to her which she never was to see, whose words her eyes never were to read, and whose love and golden fancy and rainbow dreams never were to be so much as known by her. And it was because she never was to see them that he dared to write them, straight out of his full heart, taking the exquisite pleasure of telling her what he never could permit himself to tell her face to face. Every evening he wrote thus to her, and the hour so spent glorified the entire day. The rest of the hours, all the other hours of the commonplace day, he was merely a poor schoolmaster with a long struggle before him, one who might not lift his eyes to gaze on a star. But at this hour he was her equal, meeting her soul to soul, telling out as a man might all his great love for her and wearing the jewel of it on his brow. What wonder, indeed, that the precious hour which made him a king, crowned with a mighty and unselfish passion, was above all things sacred to him, and doubly sacred when, as to-night, it followed upon an hour spent with her. Its mingled delight and pain were almost more than he could bear. He went through the kitchen and the hall, and up the narrow staircase with a glory in his eyes that thus were held from seeing his sordid surroundings. Link Hausman, sprawled out on the platform before the kitchen door, saw him pass with that rapt face and chuckled. Link was ill enough to look at any time with his sharp, freckled features and foxy eyes. When he chuckled, his face was that of an unholy imp. But the schoolmaster took no heed of him. Neither did he heed the girl whom he met in the hall. Her handsome, sullen face flushed crimson under the sting of his utter disregard, and her black eyes followed him up the stairs with a look that was not good to see. Sis, whispered Link piercingly, come out here. I've got a joke to tell you, something about the master and his girl. You ain't to let on to him, you know, though. I found it out last night when he was off to the shore. That old key of Uncle Jim's was just the thing. He's a softy, and no mistake. Upstairs, in his little room, the schoolmaster was writing his letter. The room was as bare and graceless as all the other rooms of the farmhouse where he had boarded during his term of teaching. But it looked out on the sea, and was hung with such priceless tapestry of his iris dreams and visions that it was to him an apartment in a royal palace. From it he gazed afar on bays that were like great cups of sapphire brimming over with ruby wine for gods to drain, on headlands that were like amethyst, on wide sweeps of sea that were blue and far and mysterious. And ever the moaning call of the ocean's heart came up to his heart as of one great hopeless love and longing crying out to another love and longing as great and hopeless. And here, in the rose radiance of the sunset, with the sea music in the dim air, he wrote his letter to her. My lady, how beautiful it is to think there is nothing to prevent my loving you. There is much, everything, to prevent me from telling you I love you. But nothing has any right to come between my heart and its own. It is permitted to love you for ever and ever ever and serve and reverence you in secret and silence for so much dear i thank life even though the price of the permission must always be the secret and the silence i have just come from you my lady your voice is still in my ears your eyes are still looking into mine gravely yet half smilingly sweetly yet half provokingly Oh, how dear and human and girlish and queenly you are, half saint and half very womanly woman. 
and how I love you with all there is of me to love. Heart and soul and brain, every fiber of my body and spirit thrilling to the wonder and marvel and miracle of it. You do not know it, my sweet, and you must never know it. You would not even wish to know it, for I am nothing to you but one of many friends, coming into your life briefly and passing out of it, of no more account to you than a sunshiny hour, a bird's song, a bursting bud in your garden. But the hour and the bird and the flower gave you a little delight in their turn, and when you remembered them once more before forgetting, that was their reward and blessing. That is all I ask, dear lady and I ask that only in my own heart. I am content to love you and be forgotten. It is sweeter to love you and be forgotten than it would be to love any other woman and live in her lifelong remembrance. So humble has love made me, sweet, so great is my sense of my own unworthiness. Yet love must find expression in some fashion, dear, else it is only pain, and hence these letters to you, which you will never read. I put all my heart into them. They are the best and highest of me, the buds of a love that can never bloom openly in the sunshine of your life. I weave a chaplet of them, dear, and crown you with it. They will never fade, for such love is eternal. It is a whole summer since I first met you. I had been waiting for you all my life before and did not know it but I knew it when you came and brought with you a sense of completion and fulfillment. This has been the precious year of my life, the turning point to which all things past tended, and all things future must look back. Oh, my dear, I thank you for this year. It has been your royal gift to me, and I shall be rich and great for ever because of it. Nothing can ever take it from me, nothing can mar it. It were well to have lived a lifetime of loneliness for such a boon. The price would not be too high. I would not give my one perfect summer for a generation of other men's happiness. There are those in the world who would laugh at me, who would pity me, Una. They would say that the love I have poured out in secret at your feet has been wasted, that I am a poor, weak fool to squander all my treasure of affection on a woman who does not care for me, and who is as far above me as that great white star that is shining over the sea. Oh, my dear, they do not know. They cannot understand. The love I have given you has not left me poorer. It has enriched my life unspeakably. It has opened my eyes and given me the gift of clear vision for those things that matter. It has been a lamp held before my stumbling feet, whereby I have avoided snares and pitfalls of baser passions and unworthy dreams. For all this, I thank you, dear. And for all this, surely the utmost that I can give of love and reverence and service is not too much. I could not have helped loving you, but if I could have helped it, Knowing with just what measure of pain and joy it would brim my cup, I would have chosen to love you, Una. There are those who strive to forget a helpless love. To me, the greatest misfortune that life could bring would be that I should forget you. I want to remember you always and love you and long for you. That would be unspeakably better than any happiness that could come to me through forgetting. Dear lady, good night. The sun has set. There is now but one fiery dimple on the horizon, as if a golden finger had dented it. Ah, now it is gone. The mists are coming up over the sea. A kiss on each of your white hands, dear. Tonight I am too humble to lift my thoughts to your lips. The schoolmaster folded up his letter and held it against his cheek for a little space while he gazed out on the silver-shining sea with his dark eyes full of dreams. Then he took from his shabby trunk a little inlaid box and unlocked it with a twisted silver key. It was full of letters, his letters to Una. 
The first had been written months ago, in the early promise of a northern spring. They linked together the golden weeks of the summer. Now, in the purple autumn, the box was full and the schoolmaster's term was nearly ended. He took out the letters reverently and looked over them, now and then murmuring below his breath some passages scattered through the written pages. He had laid bare his heart in those letters, writing out what he never could have told her, even if his love had been known and returned. For dead and gone generations of stern and repressed forefathers laid their unyielding fingers of reserve on his lips, and the shyness of dreamy, book-bred youth stemmed the language of eye and tone. I will love you for ever and ever, and even though you know it not, surely such love will hover around you all your life, like an invisible benediction, not understood but dimly felt, guarding you from ill and keeping far from you all things and thoughts of harm and evil. Sometimes I let myself dream, and in those dreams you love me, and we go out to meet life together. I have dreamed that you kissed me, dreamed it so reverently that the dream did your womanhood no wrong. I have dreamed that you put your hands in mine and said, I love you. Oh, the rapture of it! We may give all we will if we do not ask for a return. There should be no barter in love. If by reason of the greatness of my love for you I were to ask your love in return, I should be a base creature. It is only because I am content to love and serve for the sake of loving and serving that I have the right to love you. I have a memory of a blush of yours, a rose of the years that will bloom forever in my garden of remembrance. Tonight you blushed when I came upon you suddenly among the flowers. You were startled. Perhaps I had broken too rudely on some girlish musing, and straight away your round, pale curve of cheek and your white arch of brow were made rosy as with the dawn of beautiful sunrise. I shall see you forever as you looked at that time. In my mad moments I shall dream, knowing all the while that it is only a dream, that you blushed with delight at my coming. I shall be able to picture forevermore how you would look at one you loved. Tonight the moon was low in the west. It hung over the sea like a shallop of ruddy gold moored to a star in the harbour of the night. I lingered long and watched it, for I knew that you too were watching it from your window that looks on the sea. You told me once that you always watched the moon set. It has been a bond between us ever since. This morning I rose at dawn and walked on the shore to think of you, because it seemed the most fitting time. It was before sunrise, and the world was virgin. All the east was a shimmer of silver, and the morning star floated in it like a dissolving pearl. The sea was a great miracle. I walked up and down by it, and said your name over and over again. The hour was sacred to you. It was as pure and unspoiled as your own soul. Una, who will bring into your life the sunrise splendor and color of love? Do you know how beautiful you are, Una? Let me tell you, dear. You are tall, yet you have to lift your eyes a little to meet mine. Such dear eyes, Una. They are dark blue, and when you smile they are like wet violets in sunshine. But when you are pensive, they are more lovely still. The spirit and enchantment of the sea at twilight passes into them then. Your hair has the gloss and brownness of ripe nuts, and your face is always pale. Your lips have a trick of falling apart in a half-smile when you listen. They told me before I knew you that you were pretty. Pretty! The word is cheap and tawdry. You are beautiful with the beauty of a pearl or a star or a white flower. Do you remember our first meeting? It was one evening last spring. You were in your garden. The snow had not all gone, but your hands were full of pale early flowers. You wore a white shawl over your shoulders and head. Your face was turned upward a little, listening to a robin's call in the leafless trees above you. 
I thought God had never made anything so lovely and love-deserving. I loved you from that moment, Una. And this is your birthday. The world has been glad of you for twenty years. It is fitting that there have been bird songs and sunshine and blossom today, a great light and fragrance over land and sea. This morning I went far afield to a long, lonely valley lying to the west, girt round about with dim old pines where feet of men seldom tread, and there I searched until I found some rare flowers meet to offer you. I sent them to you with a little book, an old book, a new book savouring of the shop and marketplace, however beautiful it might be, would not do for you. So I sent the book that was my mother's. She read it and loved it. The faded rose leaves she placed in it are there still. At first, dear, I almost feared to send it. Would you miss its meaning? Would you laugh a little at the shabby volume with its pencil marks and its rose leaves? But I knew you would not. I knew you would understand. Today I saw you with the child of your sister in your arms. I felt as the old painters must have felt when they painted their Madonnas. You bent over his shining golden head, and on your face was the mother passion and tenderness that is God's finishing touch to the beauty of womanhood. The next moment you were laughing with him, two children playing together. But I had looked upon you in that brief space, oh, the pain and joy of it it is so sweet dear to serve you a little though it be only opening a door for you to pass through or handing you a book or a sheet of music love wishes to do so much for the beloved i can do so little for you but that little is sweet this evening i read to you the poem which you had asked me to read you sat before me with your brown head leaning on your hands and your eyes cast down i stole dear glances at you between the lines when i finished i put a red red rose from your garden between the pages and crushed the book close on it that poem will always be dear to me stained with the life-blood of a rose-like hour i do not know which is sweeter your laughter or your sadness when you laugh you make me glad but when you are sad, I want to share in your sadness and soothe it. I think I am nearer to you in your sorrowful moods. Today I met you by accident at the turn of the lane. Nothing told me you were coming, not even the wind that should have known. I was sad, and then all at once I saw you and wondered how I could have been sad. You walked past me with a smile as if you had tossed me a rose. I stood and watched you out of sight. That meeting was the purple gift the day gave me. Today I tried to write a poem to you, Una, but I could not find words fine enough, as a lover could find no raiment dainty enough for his bride. The old words other men have used in singing to their loves seem too worn and common for you. I wanted only new words, crystal clear, or coloured only by the iris of the light, not words that have been steeped and stained with all the hues of other men's thoughts. So I burned the verses that were so unworthy of you. Una, some day you will love. You will watch for him. You will blush at his coming. Be sad at his going. Oh, I cannot think of it. Today I saw you when you did not see me. I was walking on the shore. And as I came around a rock, you were sitting on the other side. I drew back a little and looked at you. Your hands were clasped over your knees. Your hat had fallen back, and the sea wind was ruffling your hair. Your face was lifted to the sky. Your lips were parted. Your eyes were full of light. You seemed to be listening to something that made you happy. I crept gently away, that I might not mar your dream. Of what were you thinking, Una? I must leave you soon. Sometimes I think I cannot bear it. Oh, Una, how selfish it is of me to wish that you might love me. Yet I do wish it, although I have nothing to offer you but a great love and all my willing work of hand and brain. If you loved me, I fear I should be weak enough to do you the wrong 
of wooing you. I want you so much, dear. The schoolmaster added the last letter to the others and locked the box. When he unlocked it again, two days later, the letters were gone. He gazed at the empty box with dilated eyes. At first he could not realize what had happened. The letters could not be gone. He must have made a mistake, have put them in some other place. With trembling fingers he ransacked his trunk. There was no trace of the letters. With a groan he dropped his face in his hands and tried to think. His letters were gone, those precious letters, held almost too sacred for his own eyes to read after they were written, had been stolen from him. The inmost secrets of his soul had been betrayed. Who had done this hideous thing? He rose and went downstairs. In the farmyard he found Link tormenting his dog. Link was happy only when he was tormenting something. He never had been afraid of anything in his life before, but now absolute terror took possession of him at the sight of the schoolmaster's face. Physical strength and force had no power to frighten the sullen lad, but all the irresistible might of a fine soul roused to frenzy looked out in the young man's blazing eyes, dilated nostrils, and tense white mouth. It cowed the boy, because it was something he could not understand. He only realized that he was in the presence of a force that was not to be trifled with. Link, where are my letters? said the schoolmaster. I didn't take them, master, cried Link, crumpling up visibly in his sheer terror. I didn't. I never taked them. It was Sis. I told her not to. I told her you'd be awful mad, but she wouldn't tend to me. It was Sis took them. Ask her if you don't believe me. The schoolmaster believed him. Nothing was too horrible to believe just then. What has she done with them? he said hoarsely. She, she sent them to Una Clifford, whimpered Link. I told her not to. She's mad at you because you want to see Una and wouldn't go with her. She thought Una would be mad at you for writing them because the Cliffords are so proud and think themselves above everybody else. So she sent them. I told her not to. The schoolmaster said not another word. He turned his back on the whining boy and went to his room. He felt sick with shame. The indecency of the whole thing revolted him. It was as if his naked heart had been torn from his breast and held up to the jeers of a vulgar world by the merciless hand of a scorned and jealous woman. He felt stunned as if by a physical blow. After a time, his fierce anger and shame died into a calm desperation. The deed was done, beyond recall. It only remained for him to go to Una, tell her the truth, and implore her pardon. Then he must go from her sight and presence forever. It was dusk when he went to her home. They told him that she was in the garden, and he found her there, standing at the curve of the box walk among the last late-blooming flowers of the summer. Have you thought from his letters that she was a wonderful woman of marvellous beauty? Not so. She was a sweet and slender slip of girlhood, with girlhood's own charm and freshness. There were thousands like her in the world, thank God for it, but only one like her in one man's eyes. He stood before her, mute, with shame, his boyish face white and haggard. She had blushed crimson all over her dainty paleness at sight of him and laid her hand quickly on the breast of her white gown. Her eyes were downcast and her breath came shortly. He thought her silence the silence of anger and scorn. He wished that he might fling himself in the dust at her feet. Una, Miss Clifford, forgive me, he stammered miserably. I, I did not send them. I never meant that you should see them. A shameful trick has been played upon me. Forgive me. For what am I to forgive you? She asked gravely. She did not look up, but her lips parted in the little half-smile he loved. The blush was still on her face. For my presumption, he whispered. I, I could not help loving you, Una. If you had read the letters, you know all the rest. 
I have read the letters, every word, she answered, pressing her little hand a little more closely to her breast. Perhaps I should not have done so, for I soon discovered that they were not meant for me to read. I thought at first you had sent them, although the writing of the address on the packet did not look like yours. But even when I knew you did not, I could not help reading them all. I do not know who sent them, but I am very grateful to the sender. Grateful? he said wonderingly. Yes, I have something to forgive you, but not, not your presumption. It is your blindness, I think, and, and your cruel resolution to go away and never tell me of your, your love for me. If it had not been for the sending of these letters, I might never have known. How can I forgive you for that? Una, he said. He had been very blind, but he was beginning to see. He took a step nearer and took her hands. She threw up her head and gazed, blushingly, steadfastly, into his eyes. From the folds of her gown she drew forth the little packet of letters and kissed it. Your dear letters, she said bravely, they have given me the right to speak out. I will speak out. I love you, dear. I will be content to wait through long years until you can claim me. I... I have been so happy since your letters came. He put his arms round her and drew her head close to his. Their lips met. End of The Schoolmaster's Letters